Life Audio. Faith Over Fear is brought to you by Life Audio and is part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational, faith affirming podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com. Hello. Welcome to the Faith Over Fear podcast, where we attack our most pervasive fears with truth. Because life is too short for any of us to live enslaved. At Holy Love Ministries, we are passionate about helping God's children discover, embrace, and live in God's freedom. We would love to connect with you online. Just visit our show notes to learn how to connect with us. In business, you rarely hear the expression, for life. You make a purchase for a product, for a service, and, and there's, a, there's a time frame there. Well, that's not the case with Awaken 180 weight loss. Allow me to explain. You know, a year ago, I started with Awaken 180 weight loss and had incredible success losing weight. But you can lose all the weight in the world and not keep it off. And what good is it? That's why I have support for life from Awaken 180. Yeah. I mean, I go back for check-ins and make sure everything's going smoothly. But if I ever had a problem, the counselors are there to get me back on track. Why don't you do what I did and call for a consultation? 844-346-1800. 844-346-1800. Or go to awaken180weightloss.com. It's time for Medicaid open enrollment in Delaware. From Wilmington to Bethany Beach, connections run deep in the first state. And AmeriHealth Caritas Delaware is dedicated to connecting you to care. To learn more, visit AmeriHealthCaritasDE.com. Hello, I'm Kelly Campbell with Holy Loved Ministries. Visit our website and join one of our virtual Bible studies. With me today is Gina Birchmeyer, who is a licensed professional counselor and award-winning author and speaker. She holds a master's degree in psychology and theology and has advanced training in trauma and evidence-based therapies to help people heal. Gina, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Kelly. It's great to be with you today. And you have a new book, got kind of a long title. It's called Generations Deep, Unmasking Inherited Dysfunction and Trauma to Rewrite Our Stories Through Faith and Therapy. And I have to admit, seriously, I have about two thirds of the book highlighted. It's just such a moving story. It's really one of those books that's very hard to put down once you get started. And I think for me, this reason was that this is a subject that I believe everybody faces, but so many of us don't know how to name. And you use several terms like intergenerational trauma and generational wounds, but you also use a scientific term that I had never heard of. And I'm going to take this slow, transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. Is that correct? And you got it. Well, that's a mouthful. Can you explain this concept? Sure. So the whole concept of generational wounds, intergenerational wounds, intergenerational trauma, you might sort of kind of begin to think about, oh, you're talking about something that goes from one generation to the next, which is true. But when we talk about transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, what we're talking about is something that's at a scientific deeper level than just behaviors and traits and beliefs. We're talking about not altering DNA, but we're talking about epigenetics, not genetics, epigenetics. So if you think about genetics, epigenetics just means over, okay? So around, above. So that's what our epigenetics is. And epigenetics, if you, if you, here's a way you could think about it. So think about a book, your genetics are the book, right? You've got the manuscript written exactly the way you want it. You know what you want the world to experience in this book. You know what is gonna come forward. However, the editor then comes along and says, well, we're not going to actually put this out there. We're going to do this instead, or we're going to make this bigger and we're going to amplify this. That's what the epigenetics does. Mm -hmm. So the genes are sort of the thing that you have, but the epigenetics are kind of what might turn it on or turn it off. And when we talk about things like trauma responses, addictions, different things like that, we see that component of epigenetics manifesting 
in the lives from generation to generation to generation. And what's beautiful about epigenetics is that we now know that there are a multitude of things that can influence our epigenetics and move us toward the things that we want and away from the things that we don't want. That's incredible. It's it's just, it's all kind of mind blowing to be honest with you, how complex the brain and our bodies really are. Yes. I will tell you that I have heard of this before, but growing up in kind of Christian circles in the Christian church, I always heard the term generational curses. And as I've grown, I've realized now that that's mostly based on verses from Exodus, like Exodus 20, verse 5, and Exodus 34, verse 7, both of which talk about how the sins of the father or the parent will be passed down to the third and fourth generation. And I have to tell you, it honestly instilled a fear in me because I thought, if I'm not perfect, my kids, my grandkids and their kids, they're just doomed. But you have such a beautiful, different take in your book. So can you kind of talk about how you see God in both what the Bible says and what science says? Sure. So initially, I felt the same way, Kelly, about those verses. When when I learned those verses, I just thought, how, what sort of loving, benevolent God would crack a whip that would reach out three and four generations to leave a mark for something that someone did in the past, right? And then when I started my own healing journey and I started learning about the science behind it, and I started learning more about who God really is and unlearning who I thought he was, the the thing that's so beautiful is what I discovered is that that's more of a benevolent warning. It's, It's, listen, if you don't figure this stuff out, if you do not heal from this, it will inevitably repeat from generation to generation to generation until someone is ready to say, this stops with me. And so recognizing it as something that was loving and embracing it as something that God was trying to warn us about really helped me sort of take the edges off of that verse and see it for what it really is. Science points us to this. The Bible points us to this, that whole ripple effect of our healing, right? In scripture, it's funny because growing up and I grew up Catholic and everybody has their own story around their faith. But growing up in certain faith circles, there is, you hear about all the people in scripture who were these great, powerful saints of the Lord, right? And they they had these amazing, but we don't spend a whole lot of time talking about the BC, the before Christ, the before God, right? That they were, they were drunk, they were liars, they were murderers, they were deceptive, they were, you, you know, fill, they were the fill in the blank, right? We don't really spend a lot of time thinking about what the journey to healing looked like for them to get to where they were. And so I think we see a lot of beautiful examples of that journey in scripture and then also in science. So one of the verses I love to point to is Romans 12, being transformed by the renewing of your mind. So renewing is a perpetual text, right? It's It implies that we're going to continue doing something. And what we now know is that our brain has neurogenesis capabilities and plasticity that goes throughout the life cycle, right? So there's constantly this ability to rewire, to refire our neurons, if you will. There's this ability for healing. We also have these beautiful experiences of emotionally corrective experiences that can happen here now in our present that have a salvific effect on our story that sort of have this retroactive component to it where it's kind of like it goes back, it helps us find these things in our history and heals them here now in the present. And I think that is also a beautiful example of what God does through our salvation, taking these things, these wounds of our past, healing us in the here and now and bringing us forward into that journey that he has created for us. That is beautiful. And and what a great way to see how God works in these situations. There is something I'd love to clarify. I used to tease my parents that our family put the fun in dysfunctional. (laughs) My mother never thought it was funny, but I did. It's a little funny. It's funny. (laughs) Is there a difference between generational trauma and dysfunction? Yeah, a little bit. So when we think about traumas, we tend to think about events, right? And think about also trauma isn't necessarily the event. Okay. We don't call, we call the event traumatic. The trauma is what it leaves us with. 
right? The trauma is the result of what we didn't get in the moment of that wounding that we needed. So it's about what happened. It's also about what didn't happen. That's the trauma. The dysfunction is more the patterns uh, that result in that. So it's addiction, it's triangulation, it's emotionally holding people hostage, it's taking responsibility, it's over-functioning, it's codependency. It's all of those types of things that we think about when we think about dysfunction, whereas the trauma is, as I said, the event or the lack of something happening. And then the dysfunction is kind of what we see from one generation to the next. So... How would I know? How would our listeners know if they are suffering from a traumatic wounding or traumatic event versus kind of just growing up in a dysfunctional family? Yeah. So I would say that that's a little bit muddier, Mm -hmm. but we can begin to ask ourselves some questions. How are we doing in our relationships with others, with God and with ourselves? Do we feel like we're in a healthy space of relationship? Do we know what it's like to be a safe person for ourselves and for other people? Do we seem like we keep finding ourselves in the same relationships that wound us over and over and over again? Do we find ourselves unable to hold big emotions when big things happen, whether it's our own big emotions or our children's big emotions or our friends or our spouses? Do we have a really hard time with that? Do we tend to take the blame for everything? No matter what goes wrong, we're just assuming it's something that we've done. So these are kind of some of the things that we can begin to look at. And in the book, I have something called the Expanded Trauma Perspective Questionnaire. In business, you rarely hear the expression for life. You make a purchase for a product, for a service, and and there's there's a time frame there. Well, that's not the case with Awaken 180 weight loss. Allow me to explain. You know, a year ago, I started with Awaken 180 weight loss and had incredible success losing weight. But you can lose all the weight in the world and not keep it off. And what good is it? That's why I have support for life from Awaken 180. Yeah. I mean, I go back for check-ins and make sure everything's going smoothly. But if I ever had a problem, the counselors are there to get me back on track. Why don't you do what I did and call for a consultation? 844-346-1800. 844-346-1800. Or go to awaken180weightloss.com. It's time for Medicaid open enrollment in Delaware. From Wilmington to Bethany Beach, connections run deep in the first state. And AmeriHealth Caritas Delaware is dedicated to connecting you to care. To learn more, visit AmeriHealthCaritasDE.com or call 800-996-9969. And the reason I created that is because there's another tool out there called the ACE, the Adverse Childhood Experience Inventory. And it asks a lot of questions about things that happen, but they tend to be the bigger T traumas like physical abuse, drug addiction, a drug usage in the home, chronic pervasive poverty, things like that. And what we know is that a lot of those, they're big and they're huge and they can impact us, but there are other things that can be considered traumatic. And so oftentimes when I sit with clients, I will hear them start to share a story and they pull it back right away and say, but you know, it's not as bad as what so-and-so went through. Or I read about what happened to so-and-so and and gosh, that my, my stuff is nothing compared to that. And that's so dishonoring, not only to our story, but to the journey of healing that God is waiting to walk us through when we just want to dismiss it and push it away. So the ETPQ was created with the help of 60 other trauma-informed therapists to help people get a bigger, more expansive look at the things that might have been labeled benign previously that are actually impacting them in their life today. That's amazing. And you're so right. It's so hard. I'm a disabled person, and it's very difficult when people come up to me and say, well, I'm having a bad day, but I think about you and all you're going through. And then my day is fine. And I just want to grab them and go, don't downplay your reality. If it's hard for you, then it's hard for you. You don't need to compare it to me. Uh, So I think these are very important. One of the things that you also said that I really loved was 
You don't know what you don't know until you know it. And when you know it, you must do something about it because knowledge is only power when it's combined with action. That's a nugget. I loved that. (laughs) Thank you. So we identify it. We say, okay, yes, I'm seeing these things. I've done the checklist, but then what's next? Yes. So what's next? I'm an advocate for sharing that. Like once you know, you share, right? You take it, of course you take it to God. And then you also find someone close to you who has proven themselves safe and proven themselves trustworthy. And you begin to share it because the weight is lightened just by sharing it. Okay. The power is taken away by speaking it out into the light. And then you begin to look at what does it mean to go and get some help with this? Mm -hmm. Because we can find a lot of function in our dysfunction. However, that's exhausting and that's not freedom. And we're told in scripture that Christ came to set us free, right? And that freedom is for here and now. It is for freedom that he set us free. That begins today, not in some ethereal place outside of this temporal world, right? Like that begins here and now. And so what does it mean to live that free life that we're created for? And when we don't know the answer to that, then we have to go get some help in figuring that out. And that really opens another whole, I hate to say can of worms, but your your chapter 20, the mental health and Christian circles. Mm. I think I have the entire chapter highlighted (laughs) because you really spend this time talking about how it's okay to have both Jesus and a therapist. But I know that so many are afraid of doing of going to a therapist because they might be seen as not having a strong enough faith. They're not trusting enough. They're not praying enough. But you are a professional counselor and therapist who is also a Christian. What is your perspective? Well, first, I would say that neuroscience and understanding how the brain and body heal has actually emboldened my faith. It has not reduced or diminished my faith. And I think that, you know, in most circles, when in most faith circles, when someone is physically ill, when they have a physical ailment or they're diagnosed with a disease, we never fault them for going to the doctor. We don't say, don't take your medicine. Don't get that life-saving surgery. Don't use those, those appliances that will help you function better in daily life. We don't do that. And yet, why do we do that with mental and emotional health? It is, it is so unfair And it's really, I'm going to use the word, it's hypocritical because we're saying, oh, look at all of these tools that God has allowed you to have for your physical health. Because of how he's made you, these tools work in line with how he has created your body to heal, right? Why don't we do the same thing with mental and emotional health? Look at all of these tools and these things that God has has shown us, right? These abilities to learn how the brain works, how the body works, how our gut health is connected, how how our physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual all intertwine, one affecting the next, affecting the next. And I think it shows a great faith in how God has created us when we say these therapies seem to be in line with how he's wired us for healing, growth, and change. So I'm going to step into that journey as God leads Because that honors the way that he has wired me for healing, growth, and change. I think it is a testament to your belief in his creation of you rather than antithetical to your faith. I think that's a beautiful way to put it, that it's actually a bigger step of faith to go out and seek help and get what you need for healing. And I I love because I know that you've walked through this. You know, one of the very first things that I highlighted in your book, you wrote lots of risks come in saying yes to putting out your story, especially when the story involves the generations before you and after you. I paraphrase, I apologize. I know you are a survivor of generational dysfunction and trauma, and yet you wrote this book and it is raw and it is real. And I know that just had to be frightening. You said earlier that's by telling your story that God uses you, that heals you. So how can other survivors use their story in their healing process? So you don't have to write a book to do it, right? I think the best way to really use your story to help other people is to heal your story first. Because inevitably what's going to happen is as you begin to get ready to put more out there in the world, as you heal, as you grow, as you learn, as you change, 
God will inevitably begin to open doors to cross paths you with other people who need to hear your message. You're going to hear something in a person. You're going to see something in a person. The Holy Spirit is going to prompt you to share something from your story. That's going to be just the thing that person needs. Oftentimes it's like instantaneous. It just flows out of you because healing becomes who you are, right? And wounded people wound people, but healing people help heal people. So I think the most powerful thing you can do to help other people is to work on your own journey because it will impact everyone that you ever interact with. You're going to put that healed version of yourself out into the world. And this world needs a lot more healed people. It really does. Mm -hmm. So much so. You and I were talking earlier and I know in my own journey of kind of dealing with generational issues, intergenerational issues was it wasn't the event it was the lying that happened after it that really got to me. And while I praise God, feel very released from the traumatic event. And I, I can see in my own children's lives, how this cycle has stopped. I still carry anger toward the generation behind me and the one behind them. And unfortunately, all but one of the players in this story are no longer with us. And <laughs> I struggle some days. What do you do with this anger toward, and especially if you're going through this and the people that hurt you are still around you and you know, they're never going to apologize. They're never going to see what they did as wrong. And I know you went through that. So how do you handle that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really hard. So a couple of things that worked for me and I've seen it helpful in uh, for other people is first remembering that forgiveness is not a one and done. And with each step of healing, there's oftentimes more of a need for forgiveness. There's new anger. There's a new revelation of, oh my gosh, I'm struggling with this. And I see that it's connected to that. And so then that's a whole nother opportunity for some frustration, for some anger. And it's also an opportunity as you're ready and as is helpful, it's another opportunity for forgiveness. So they don't have to ask for it. They don't have to be alive right? There is, an, there is an element of forgiveness that is really about our deeper healing. It's about recognizing for me, a lot of it was I can hold compassion and grace for what happened and mercy and still be able to say that was inexcusable. It shouldn't have happened. My wounds were deep and I had to do a lot of work because of it, because you didn't do your work. And I also release you from that because I know that your wounding me came from your wounds and I can hold compassion for your wounds. It's another level of freedom. I see and hear people say, you don't have to forgive your abuser. You don't have to forgive the person who hurt you in order to heal. Well, I'm going to say that that's only partially true. I think that there is some power that comes from having some righteous anger about the things that have happened. But I think that there is something that zaps our power back away if we hold on to unforgiveness, if we hold on to the anger and the rage, because that's emotional energy. And we want to take all of our emotional energy and push that toward healing. We want to direct all of that to our healing, to our growth, to our freedom. We don't want to be continuing to hold on to that. It doesn't do anything. We can have a boundary. We can keep that person out of our lives, but it doesn't do anything to help us by holding on to that anger, to holding on to that unforgiveness. Yeah. What's the old saying? They're living rent-free in your head. Mm, and taking yeah. up so much time and energy. It's so true. And you bring up a very good point that forgiveness does not mean condoning. Doesn't yes. mean you have no right to do what you did. It, and I'm not saying that. I'm saying I'm not going to let you continue to affect my everyday. Right. What happens when the script is flipped? We're both uh, mothers of adult children. So when our children come to us or maybe someone's listening and said, you know, I know because of generations past, I made poor decisions as a parent. And now my children have come to me and said, you hurt me. Yes. So that's, that's D that that's to me is a scary one. Yeah. So I've been there. And actually my book says the, the dedication to my part of my dedication is to my kids. And I tell them, I'm sorry, I didn't know better sooner. And 
you know, knowing better and being able to do something about it are two different things, right? Like we might know and feel somewhat powerless in our behaviors repeating over and over again. So we need to go get some help for that. But I think as you become aware of these things, you have two options. One, if you're becoming aware that this is something that you have done, I have to, I have apologized to my kids. I have sat down with my kids. I have explained to them, well, they've all read the book. They read it before it published. So they, they really, really know. But I have apologized to my kids. I have told them because my oldest is 34 and my youngest is 27. And I have told them that at any point in life, if something, if a light bulb goes on, they can come to me and say, you know what, I'm struggling with this. And I think it's related to this when I was a kid. And I just want to talk to you about how that hurt me, how that's affected me. I'm going to hold space for them. It's going to be hard, but I'm going to do it because they deserve it. And I know what it felt like to not have that. And I am not going to put my kids through that. I am willing to sit there and to deal with that to keep them from having to hold the weight that I carried for so many years. So I would say be open. And oftentimes that also requires that we have to go get help because if we've had trauma in our history and we've had a lot of emotional attacks, or if we've had parents who have made us parentified us and made us responsible for their emotional health and well-being, when our kids come at us with their big emotions, we're not going to be able to handle it. We're going to want to, maybe we want to with every fiber of our being, but we're not going to be able to. That's another space where we need to go and get some help and then be able to sit with our kids. I've offered every one of my kids, if you want to go to therapy, we'll help you pay for it. You want to go to therapy with me. You want me to come with you for a session, What whatever you need. And I think opening that door is, it's one of those emotionally corrective experiences that we talked about earlier. And I, and if anytime I can give that to my kids, I want to be able to give that to my kids. And I want to do it in light of my relationship with God, because I want them to see that where I am today and my ability to hold space for them is because of Jesus, not because of anything else, because I want them to make that connection for their own faith walk. Yes. And it shows them in living color, the grace and mercy of Jesus, of the relationship we have with a very loving father. Uh, Even though I know it's hard not to get defensive when someone comes and says, you've hurt me, but it just to to take that deep breath and figure out beautiful. Anything else you'd like to add? Well, I would like to add that it's never too late. So if there's been even the tiniest stirring for someone who has listened to our conversation today, it is never too late to do this work. It is never too late to open the door for your kids. It is never too late for change, for healing, for growth. So if that's the voice that's spinning in your head, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Don't accept that. That is not true. God has better and has more for you. And that is the powerful truth right there. And I love that. So thank you so much for joining us. Yes. We're going to put a link to your website in the show notes below. And again, for those listening, Gina's book is called Generations Deep, Unmasking Inherited Dysfunction and Trauma to Rewrite Our Stories Through Faith and Therapy. And I understand there's now a workbook companion. Yes. So I'm really excited about that. One of the things that we heard so much from the book is because the the book will take you through my story. And you can stay at that level. You can just read my story. You can read the science. You can read the faith. You can do all of that. But you can also engage in your own story. And there are ample invitations to do that throughout the book. There's questionnaires. There's assessments. There's questions and prompts. And so something that we heard, because small groups are adopting this book, the recovery community is adopting this book. And what we kept hearing was there's not enough room in the book So we decided to make a companion workbook slash journal, and it's relatively unconventional because it isn't just space to make the, you know, to put your answers. There are self-care tips, there are scriptures, there are positive affirmations. There's a space for when you're ready to do therapy, whether it's with a counselor or with a pastor who's trauma informed, there's a space to process all of that with specific questions to help guide you before, during, and after your sessions. There's the questions from the book amplified, and then there's opportunities to create and then edit your intention for growth 
throughout the journal. So we're really excited about it and it's being adopted quickly. And we're also going to be launching in-person and online Generations Deep groups in January of 2023. So in the next couple of months, we'll start talking about that on social media. That is wonderful. And how would people find you on social media? So they can find me at My Out Loud Voice on social media. And they can also just look at Gina Burkmeyer, but it'll, it should, they'll see my out loud voice. That's really the best way. Yeah. I love that handle. That's so powerful. Thank you. I cannot recommend the book enough, but I will tell again and say it several times, get your highlighters out, get your pens out, get your markers out because it's just nugget after nugget and it's powerful. And I can't wait to get the workbook. So again, thank you so much. Thanks, Kelly. And thank you all for listening. I hope our conversation deepened your understanding of God and helped you rest more fully in His grace. If you haven't already done so, we encourage you to subscribe to this podcast. Then you won't miss a single episode. And please make sure to share it on social media. We'd be super encouraged if you would rate it as well. That helps others to find it. Until next time, may you live with the courage of one who has truly been set free. Faith Over Fear is a production of Life Audio and Salem Media. If you liked what you heard today, please take a second to rate and review this podcast in your favorite podcast app so that more listeners like you can find the show. For more faith-filled, inspirational podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com. In business, you rarely hear the expression, for life. You make a purchase for a product, for a service, and, and there's, a, there's a time frame there. Well, that's not the case with Awaken 180 weight loss. Allow me to explain. You know, a year ago, I started with Awaken 180 weight loss and had incredible success losing weight. But you can lose all the weight in the world and not keep it off. And what good is it? That's why I have support for life from Awaken 180. Yeah. I mean, I go back for check-ins and make sure everything's going smoothly. But if I ever had a problem, the counselors are there to get me back on track. Why don't you do what I did and call for a consultation? 844-346-1800. 844-346-1800. Or go to awaken180weightloss.com. It's time for Medicaid open enrollment in Delaware. From Wilmington to Bethany Beach, connections run deep in the first state. And AmeriHealth Caritas Delaware is dedicated to connecting you to care. To learn more, visit AmeriHealthCaritasDE.com or call 800-996-9969.